Hello, I'm Ray Perlmer, and I'll be talking about Breaking Category 5 Sphinx Plus with SHA-256. This is joint work with John Kelsey and Dave Cooper, my colleagues at NIST. So Sphinx Plus is a stateless hash-based signature scheme that was selected for standardization by NIST. Here we present a forgery attack that reduces classical security by about 40 bits uh, for some of the submitted parameter sets, in particular those that are aiming for 256 bits of security or Category 5 and are trying to reach that using the SHA-256 hash function. Our attack builds on a previous attack by Antonov, uh, which contradicted the DMSPR uh, security property of SHA-256, uh, which is needed for the security proof of Sphinx Plus. The, the Sphinx Plus team has subsequently proposed a tweak, which defeats our attack uh, by using SHA-512 instead of SHA-256 as necessary. So the talk will be organized as follows. I'll first give some background on hash-based signatures, then I will talk about how those principles are implemented in particular in Sphinx Plus. I will talk about specifically the DMSPR property uh, and Antonov's attack. And then I'll talk about how we extend that attack to produce a full forgery on Sphinx Plus in particular by way of forging the Winternet's one-time signature scheme, or Watts Plus. Uh, I'll also talk about some of the optimizations we use to get the complexity uh, stated in the paper. And finally, I'll give some concluding remarks and talk about the Sphinx Plus tweak. So the most basic kind of hash-based signature is a one-time signature where, given a key pair, a public key and a private key, the signer can sign exactly one message uh, of, say, n bits. And the simplest of these one-time hash-based signature schemes is that of Lamport. And in that case, for each bit of the message to be signed or the message digest, the signer selects a secret, which will be used to sign zero, and another secret, which would be used to sign one. The public key is then just the concatenation of the hashes of, uh, of all two n secrets, and the signature consists of revealing the appropriate secrets for the value of each bit. Now, this isn't the most efficient uh, one-time signature scheme, and in particular, Sphinx uses a more advanced variant of one-time signatures, the Watts Plus signature, which we discuss later in more detail. And the idea of these sorts of schemes is you want to reduce the signature size by using things like hash chains, and also reduce the public key size by instead of using the concatenation of a bunch of hashes, you hash that whole string of bits down to um, a single hash output value. Now, that means that the public key is, is no longer this longer thing, uh, however, it's going to be useful to talk about the longer thing that gets hashed, and so we will call that a public key preimage. So, a one time signature on its own isn't necessarily that useful. You would like to sign many messages without changing your public key. And for this, um, the, the simplest way to do it is combine many public keys into a structure like a Merkle tree, where, um, where um, public keys are hashed together in pairs until 
you just have a single public key for um, for exponentially uh, many key pairs. Uh, but the nice thing then is you only need to add um, sort of the sister hash of each um, of each node at each level of the tree. Now, one downside of using a Merkle tree is that the public key is derived from all of the key pairs that would ever be used. And if you want a signature that will last longer than you are willing to spend on generating key pairs, uh, you can use uh, a layered approach or a hyper tree. In this case, you generate a smaller Merkle tree and the leaves of the Merkle tree will sign the root of another Merkle tree which can be computed at signing time. So this can be further improved to avoid the difficulty of having to keep track of what has and hasn't been signed. So if you have enough layers in your hypertree such that the number of leaves is so large that even if you pick the leaves randomly, it is unlikely that the same leaf at the bottom of the hypertree will be used twice, then, um, of course, there's no need to keep track of state. Uh, now, this will produce a pretty large hypertree if you do it as described. So real stateless hash-based signature schemes try to make the hypertree somewhat smaller by instead of using a signature that breaks if it's ever used twice, you use a few times signature which remains secure as long as it's not used to sign you know, some larger number of messages. Now, you still have to make sure that the one-time signatures higher in the hypertree are not used to sign more than one Merkle tree root. And to do this, rather than having the one-time signature key pairs uh, generated truly randomly, they're generated pseudo-randomly from a seed and uh, that's part of the private key. So, Sphinx Plus in particular, how does it instantiate these concepts? The Merkle roots are all signed by the Watts Plus signature scheme, uh, which will be the focus of our attack. And the uh, message digest itself, uh, which is a randomized message digest, is signed by a few times signature called fours. Now fours, uh, the, the key has the structure also of a tree, and the root of that tree is signed by Watts Plus. Now, the, um, to determine which fours key is actually used to sign the message and where that lives in the hypertree. The message digest is actually extended beyond what's signed with fours. And so the extended part is used to determine which fours key will be used to sign. So everything so far we've described using kind of a, a simple hash in hash chains, in hash trees, so on and so forth. But Sphinx Plus actually uses a, um, a hash with a prefix that depends on what the hash is used for. And the reason for this is to avoid multi-target pre-image attacks. So the idea here is that there are many places in the hypertree that 
an attacker might try to find a pre-image for in order to forge the signature. And if the attacker can simply try hashing things and then decide later what that hash value has to be a pre-image of, then uh, the attacker can, if, if the attacker has T targets, the attacker can save a factor of T in terms of computation to find a pre-image of something. Uh, now that T is, is roughly going to be proportional to the number of signatures, uh, honest signatures that are provided. So, yeah, to avoid, avoid this attack, force the attacker to decide what pre-image is being looked for. Sphinx Plus includes a prefix for every message. And this, the property that this prefixing works is formalized by describing the prefixed hash function as a tweakable hash function with the distinct function multi-target pre-image resistance property. So, to see why SHA-256 might not provide this property to the extent desired, we need to look a bit at how SHA-256 is constructed. It uses something called the Merkle-Damgard construction, where the message is broken into blocks, and a compression function repeatedly takes the internal state of the hash function back down to the same as the output length of 256 bits. Now, this means that you can find all kinds of internal collisions. You can find, you can get it to collide on H0, H1, H2, not just the final hash, which means if you're trying to get more than the collision security of um, for some property of the hash function, like multi-collision resistance or uh, even pre-image resistance, then um, you may not be getting what you think you are. Now, DM SPR is another one of these properties, and as we'll see in the next slide, it is not immune to these problems. Or actually, let's slide, slide after, because this, this is uh, the hurting attack, which is an older attack that's kind of a stepping stone to attacking the DMSPR property. So here the idea is if we have a bunch of messages with different prefixes, we want to append some message blocks to these prefixes so that these messages with these prefixes all collide to the same value. And the herding attack is accomplished by building something called a diamond structure, uh, which is pictured above. So we start with distinct prefixes in uh, the internal state after the prefix. Then we pair off two, you know, pairs of prefixes and we find message blocks that produce an internal collision of the next block for each pair, and we have half as many, and we repeat this until, after adding logarithmically many blocks to the prefix, all the messages will hash to the same chaining value, and in the figure above, that's H30. So, how does this apply to DMSPR? The idea of DMSPR is we want to find T target hashes with different um, prefixes for the message that must reach that target. And we want to find, um, yeah, a pre image. So, first, we apply the herding attack so that regardless of what the prefix happened to be, we can add blocks to reach the same internal state of the hash function. Then we search for one additional block, which 
will reach one of the targets. And because we've done this herding, we can find some, some message blocks leading from the prefix that matches that target to the internal state we used uh, to find the preimage. Now, this attack is more effective if you have more blocks to play with, but the longest hash input in Sphinx Plus, uh, the WOTS plus public key, is in fact still fairly short. It's only 34 blocks. So in order to get the best complexity, Antonov observed that it would be helpful to use uh, three collisions instead of two collisions in a lot of cases. So, um, so here we get a complexity of about 2 to the 210 by using two collisions on the first 10 blocks and three collisions on the next 23 blocks. Okay, so that shows that the DMSPR property doesn't really hold, but does this lead to a real attack? So with Antonov's attack used as is, we can create a validly signed Watts plus public key preimage for less than 2 to the 256 work. But if we actually want to uh, forge a Sphinx plus signature, we will need to actually use the Watts plus uh, public key to sign something, which means we don't just need a public key pre image. We, in fact, need something more like the private key. But that raises a certain difficulty because as we start adding blocks during the herding and the pre image phase, those blocks will consist of the tops of hash chains. And in order to go backwards in those hash chains, we need to have produced it by hashing something. But what prefix do we use when we do that? We often have to match multiple different prefixes. And so there's no way to actually force the correct prefix. But we can still do something that's almost as good, which is as long as we, um, we don't have to be able to sign every digest. So if we can arrange it so that we know enough of the private key that we can sign multiple possible uh, Merkle tree roots, then we can still uh, brute force search and find something we can sign for less than 2 to the 256 work. So, our attack is organized as follows. We find a pre-image of some Watts plus public key uh, and get enough private key information so that we can sign some digests. Then we brute force search for a valid Merkle tree root or a forged tree root um, that has a digest we can sign, then we sign the tree root, and then we can forge signatures by just trying message randomization strings until the hypertree address uh, is in the is, is downstream from the Watts plus key that we were able to forge. So let's look how the Watts plus signature works in more detail. So the way Watts plus works is we take the message digest and um, break it into digits base W. And for all the parameter sets, W is 16. So these are hexadecimal digits. Now the Watts plus signature also appends a base W checksum, which is 960 
in this case. So the maximum value of the sum of digits minus the sum of digits. So each digit of the digest and the checksum is signed by taking secrets, the, the secret key, and hashing it d sub i times. And so the um, result of, of those hashes of that secret are put into the signature. One thing to note, looking at this signature, is that if we intend to sign the highest base 16 digit, uh, which is 15 or XF, that's just part of the public key preimage. So we don't actually need to find any further preimages. So what kind of digests can we sign? The idea here is we have a suffix of the digest we're trying to sign, which is all these Fs, which are sort of automatically signable. And then prior to that, we have um, digits that might be uh, just about anything. So how do we modify Antonov's attack so that we can sign these digests? So the first part is, in order to sign the, um, the unspecified digits uh, marked as X, uh, we're going to treat the part that signs those as prefix. That way, we actually know what prefix to use in those hash chains. And we can um, provide, we can just pick a random number for SKI0 for all of those parts and just hash it up to make uh, the prefix for the uh, public key preimage we intend to forge. But the next part um, that signs F, we don't need to know any preimages. So we'll use that part for herding and multi-target preimage search. Finally, rather than targeting the final public key hash, we will target the internal state of SHA-256 immediately before the first block that will sign the checksum. This is to make sure that we can produce a valid signature on the checksum, whichever target we happen to reach, because we will simply take the, um, the public key preimage and the checksum from the honest signature. So this will work fine as long as the checksum actually matches the digest that we try to sign. So how do we make sure that works out? Well, the checksum in this case is 960 minus 41 times 15 minus the sum of all those X digits. Now we can increment the uh, the uh, checksum, but we cannot uh, decrement it. We can't decrement any of the digits of the honest checksum. So this means that the sum of all those x's needs to be fairly small, or the checksum needs to be very small. And to make this work out, we will choose targets that have unusually small checksums. And um, then we can sign any message as long as the sum of the x's is small enough uh, with a high enough probability. Now there's one additional optimization we use to get a better complexity. So previously we described finding all the multi-collisions or two-way collisions or whatever during the herding phase as kind of you find one, you find the next. Well, it's actually 
better to find the multi-collisions kind of all at once. So we'll be using four-way collisions because um, the prefix is longer, so we have fewer blocks for hurting. So the thing to note here is that if we want to find four-way collisions, a lot of four-way collisions, we can find them all at once for a lot cheaper than finding them one by one. You can find one four-way collision by looking at two to the 192 uh, hash values. You can find T four-way collisions for a cost of two to the 192 times only T, the fourth root of T. Now, this ignores some complications. One particular complication is that in order for the herding to be useful, all the collisions need to involve different prefixes for the messages that are colliding. And that's a little tricky when you're using the parallel collision search techniques that are useful uh, when you care about reducing memory access costs. So in order to avoid wasting time colliding prefixes we've already used, uh, we compute the collisions in smaller batches, not so we don't try to collide all T, we try to collide, say, alpha T, produce alpha T collisions, and then if, um, then when we have that many, we do another collision search, um, removing the prefixes we've already used, and, um, and we keep going. There's more detail on this in the paper. So let's look at the attack complexity we achieve. So here the cost is divided into the cost of herding, uh, the cost of linking, which is that final multi-target pre-image at the end, and the cost of finding a digest that can be signed by the forged uh, Watts plus public key pre-image. And so as we see, for both Sphinx plus parameter sets using SHA-256, the cost is about 2 to the 217 compression function operations, so nearly 40 bits of security less than the design strength of those parameter sets. Now, it's good to remind everyone that Sphinx Plus did actually publish a tweak in response to Antonov's attack, and this seems to defeat the attack. So, most of the use of SHA-256 uh, is replaced with SHA-512. In particular, the uses of SHA-256 where the input is more than one message block. Now that isn't all the use of SHA-256, but the remaining use of SHA-256 does not appear to be exploitable. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that as submitted, some of the parameter sets of Sphinx Plus are not as strong as claimed. Now this is Really, not a problem with the security proof for Sphinx Plus, since Sphinx Plus, the security proof just assumes that the tweakable hash function has this DMSBR property. And it, it's so really the problem is that we're expecting SHA 256 to behave as an ideal object, even when we're expecting more than 128 bits of security from it. Now, on the upside, uh, Sphinx Plus did provide a tweak that seems to address these issues. Uh, and a another thing to note is, why do people keep using SHA-256? And the reason is, at least when hashing fixed length inputs, which is the case uh, for the use in Sphinx Plus, SHA-256 still pretty reliably will get at least 128 bits of security which is enough that 
it's unlikely that anyone's going to break it in practice. Thank you.